All right. Hello and welcome to Simply Cyber Live. Thank you for sticking with us. I'm your host, Gerald Osher, and every Thursday we talk with experts to help you take your cyber career further, faster. And if you like this, be sure to check out the Simply Cyber YouTube channel for more great cybersecurity content. And special thanks to our sponsor, Coastal Information Security Group. This week, we have a great show. We're going to be talking about keys to success as a solo cybersecurity shop with Brian Hoagley. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, of course. So before we get into it, Brian, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I've been I've been in this field for, for a minute. Um, I started out as a kid, kind of just got into what I thought was a, you know, a pretty interesting but benign field, um, mostly thanks to my uncle who uh, gave my dad a computer and said, you know, this is the future. Um, just stuck with it and, you know, worked through uh, consulting and then, you know, ended up then going to college. Uh, and then uh, so I was a non-traditional student, started when I was 22, um, got out of that, moved down to DC, uh, worked in a variety of different uh, DOD and intelligence community agencies, and then um, came out of that space after running a major program for the Pentagon, got hired by a Fortune 500 insurance company as their first vice president in CISO, and then um, stepped away from that last year to run a virtual CISO and uh, consulting uh, company now, which I've been doing for a year called Side Channel. Excellent, yeah. So, so it sounds like, I mean, obviously you have a wealth of cybersecurity experience um, and especially at the CISO role. So you like, I feel like one of those things I know we're going to talk about it here is being able to speak to the business um, and how right. important that is. So um, talking today about we're really focusing in on those individuals that are basically, they are the information security office. I know in some of the smaller businesses that I've interacted with, uh, it's usually like, you know, the IT person and because security is kind of just blanketed as security, they mm -hmm. kind of wear, they kind of wear that hat. And, you know, occasionally you'll have the one, the one person cyber shop because, you know, whatever regulations dictate that you have to have somebody who's responsible for cybersecurity. Sure. So, so for those, um, for those particular people, you know, what, what do you think is like some key things for how they, you know, could be successful kind of, at, you know, big picture. Sure. Uh, you know, I think a, a lot of folks in the one person shop too, hopefully it's larger or it's organizations who are recognizing they need to start addressing it and they are, you know, tapping somebody to come in and, and do that role. Um, so the CIO or the IT director or, you know, the CTO, whoever it is, recognizes that it's not their, you know, area of expertise. So they want to bring in somebody else. Um, if you're in a role, own the role. I think that's the biggest thing. Don't, you know, if you're one person shop, realize and just accept right now, you're, you've got a lot in front of you and that's fine and it's okay. What I love about the information security community is that it, it really is, a, a, there's a great community there. So there's a lot of people to be able to reach out to, you know, such as yourself to like ask questions, get help. Um, it's a very, it's a very great community, I think that like gives back. So, so make use of your resources that you have there. Um, the other, the other piece on, you know, is really make good uses of the resources you have within your company. A lot of people jump into, oh, I'm a one man shop. I need more people to do this job. And you're discounting the IT teams, the legal teams, the other folks inside the organization who you should be working with anyway, to help kind of move things along. So start looking at your organization as the ability to get a matrix team underneath you to actually build some things out. So tap your legal uh, group, your inside counselor, your outside counsel for their help to help you with privacy, right? Or even incident response. Work with your HR team to be able to better determine how to get employee training working for you, uh, either onboarding or during the year, right? Like these are these are two simple things and you should be working with these folks anyway. And then obviously work with and tap into your own IT team and staff, or even the developers, the engineers, or if you're working at a startup and a product company, um, these folks are the ones that you're going to look to, to put things into their backlog to address vulnerabilities and start doing remediation. So start training them, making your friends and kind of start building this matrix team because you're not going to be able to do it alone. And you might not or ever see the budget to get somebody else onto your team and expect, oh, well, now we've got two people and we'll be able to do this. So 
make use of what you have, right? Yeah, I agree uh, 100%. I mean, I've seen a couple programs that have, you know, whatever, five or six members and you talk, you talk to them about, you know, where did you come from? And they say, oh, you know, we just had one guy and, you know, basically we had a virtual security team and that's what they would call it. You know, you, you called it a matrix team, but you know, the, the, the IT people, especially, they have a vested interest in wanting yeah. to secure those assets. Um, so, you know, this wasn't one of the questions we talked about, but as a follow on, what, what would you say to someone? Cause you said your very first thing was own the role. So right. what would you say, uh, you know, to those individuals who cybersecurity is, it's a very, um, complicated field and very demanding. And if you're just kind of shifting over from IT because you're the you're the person who, you mm -hmm. know, is there, um, you know, you might be a little gun shy. So, you know, how, how would you own the role? Um, not to say imposter syndrome, but just a little gun shy on what what's right and what's what's, you know, overkill. Yeah. Well, I got a, I got a whole thing on imposter syndrome that's probably worth a whole different discussion. I, I feel like some people actually are imposters. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's besides the point. So, yeah, I mean, look, if you came over from IT, right, you've got a very, you probably have a very technical background, a good understanding of networking, ideally systems, development, engineering, architecture. So you're going to try to play to your strengths and you're going to lead with that. What you're going to discount is that information security, there's a whole realm around policy, right, that needs to be understood. And it can't just be an auditor's view of, you know, we need a policy, it has to happen like this, or the policy says this, it's totally black and white. You wanna be a successful information security professional. Um, you need to understand risk management and you need to understand it in the lens of, you know, how am I helping out the business? I got a saying, you know, enable the business and minimize asset loss. That's my job as a security leader for any organization I'm supporting, whether it's consulting to or working at a full-time, like. That's my role. That's what I hold to. Figuring that out is it, for me is owning that role. So I'm a I'm the number one advisor on security risk, you know, to the organization. It's an operational risk. How am I bringing that to the business so they better understand what their risks are, so they can balance that out with what their rewards are. That's to me. That's that's where you want to be, right? If you're just sticking in the technical realm, or the you're the auditor, or even just a pure policy wonk. Right. And there's nothing wrong with those backgrounds. Right. I've done those roles they are great roles, but you can't just live inside of that and expect, well, this is how it has to be because you're going to get viewed as, oh, you're the technical CISO or you're the technical. Like you can't you're not you've got to be versatile. This is such mm -hmm. a broad field that you need to be able to understand. You don't have to play all the roles or do all the roles. You got to better understand them. Now, I guess that's not true. If you're a one man shop, you kind of have to do all the roles. But you better at least understand all the roles if you're going to be, you know, in that one man, one woman shop. Position. Yeah. And I, and I think if you if you, you know, accidentally make the mistake and get branded as that technical CISO or the, that, you know, regulatory CISO, you end up kind of damaging yourself from being seen as a peer to, mm -hmm. you know, the CIO or to the CEO or whomever, because you're you're kind of. Um, a tool in the toolbox that serves, you know, that function versus the, the holistic um, function. Right. Th those are the, those folks, I'll go out on a limb and I might be a little controversial. I, I've been told that a couple of times. Um, those people who, who get pegged in that, those are the ones who are screaming the loudest about why they're not at the board meeting. Why don't I have a seat at the table? Like you kind of did that to yourself. <laughs> you, you can't, you can demand all you want, but you have to be invited to go sit at the big kids table. You have to mm -hmm. prove why you're the person that should be there. And if you can't talk with the adults at the big kids table at Thanksgiving, you're not going to sit there, right? If you can't hold the conversation, they don't want you there. So it's the same realm. Like if you're only talking tech or if you're only talking one area, they don't want that because that's not what they're talking about. So I, I think that's a good way to kind of look at it if you want to bridge that gap. But uh, yeah, I think a lot yeah. of people have a little ways to go in there. I agree. And I, and I feel like, you know, CISO is not even, even security. Like I I'm, I'm on this crusade, um, to explain to people that security is not like it is not the same as security. Yes. There's some overlap. It's like a Venn diagram, but it's not yeah. the same. Um, but so you, you're talking about being able to communicate, um, you know, effectively and talk at the big kids table, if you will. So what would you, how would you, 
recommend or provide guidance on how to effectively communicate with that leadership? Sure. It, it's, it's basically sales, right? You're, you're selling or convincing somebody else of something that they are uncomfortable with they've never, or they've never heard of, they just plain don't understand. You need to get them to understand your position as a risk advisor to them and the benefit that they're gonna have to come to you to help answer these questions. I, I, I kind of put it in the sense of, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I've worked with lawyers, but I, don't, I know enough that I'm, I need to seek outside legal opinion if that's the area that I need help in. I'm not going to pretend to do it. I know enough to know when it's the right time and I can navigate enough, but it's the right time to go engage outside counsel or counsel in some direction. Same thing with finance, right? It's You want your CFO, your head of legal, general counsel, even the president, you know, the owner of the company, whomever it is, to see you as that resource that they're going to be able to tap. So you need to better understand what their motivations are, where they're coming from, what are their issues, how do they like to get communicated with, when even, you know, some people don't want to be bothered in the mornings. Some people don't want to be bothered at the end of the day. Get to know your audience, right? And that's that's the stuff that I've learned just through sales. And I'm not a sales guy. I've just had to learn sales being an entrepreneur. But it's, you got to know your audience. You got to better understand it. You can't just go in with, well, this is the regulation. This is what we got to do. Boom, boom, boom. And just, here you go. Go do with it. It's like, you've got to bring them into the conversation, make them understand what the problem is, what your proposed solution is, how they benefit from it and what the risks are if they don't take your advice and are they willing to live with it and, you know, kind of roll, roll from that perspective. Yeah. I mean, that was like, a, um, that, I mean, you just laid out a template for, you should have, you should have these four things before you go speak to the, you know, to the owner or the president or whatever. And it's a great point around right. the human, the human nature. I feel like, you know, even I used to be uh, like, I came up the technical track and, you know, even I would be like, I don't understand, like, this is what you want. And this is what I'm providing without really context of, like you said, time of day, or if they've had their coffee yet, or if they just, you know, received some bad news. It's like, you, right. you, you, have, to, you have to factor, uh, factor that in for sure. So um, I, I had a follow up question, but it's, it's completely uh, lewd to me now, because I was so pumped about that, like punch list you just had. <laughs> oh, oh uh, one thing that I mean, you kind of touched on, but I really, I've always lived by this um, kind of axiom and it served me well is like, mm -hmm. if you have a problem and you have to bring it to someone who's got to have, you know, ultimately have authority to make a decision, you should bring an answer, at least one, maybe yeah. two, you know, so they can compare and contrast because people, when presented with a problem, if you give them options, like you've made their job easier, which is, which is great. Right. 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 I thought. That's why I kind of uh, push back on, you know, former auditors and the auditor view to cybersecurity because they come with really one answer that you can abide by. Mm -hmm. The one that says compliance, period. If that's not going to work, right? Compliance <laughs> is not security. Chances are you're not even compliant anyway. Yeah. But uh, it's, that's, it's, not, it's not black and white. Some things can be black and white, but overall, not, not everything. You've got to come with the options. You know, I, I always like the, the, the Simpsons movie, you know, when the, when the president, uh, you know, is presented with the five options by the one guy for the, after they put the dome, oh, yeah. he's like, he's like, I select option three. He's like, he's presented with five options. He's like, I was elected to lead, not to read. But anyway, I like, just, you got to come up with a couple. You got to, you know, because you also got to come up with some throwaways, right? You've also got to build in your, I really want you to pick number two, but I'm going to give you the far end, which is represented by three and the other far end, which is represented by one. Yes. Please pick two. Yeah. Here are three terrible options and one great one. You choose your choice, yeah. whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> so what, um, taking it kind of to a, um, I guess this isn't entirely technical, but you know, for these individuals, what skills, you know, maybe they get training, maybe they don't, maybe they get some extra cycles on Friday to, to focus on developing themselves, or maybe they just fold it into their overall work sure. week. You know, what skills do you think people in this role should really focus on first? So for if I'm a, if I'm a one person shop, right, I am immediately going to have a problem getting across why we need to do anything. Right. Unless you have a regulator demanding that you do something or a customer or your board. Right. Those three areas are, are huge motivators. Right. Those those are usually catalysts to we need to do something on security. 
But if you don't have those or they're not really strong, you've really got nothing that you can kind of hold to that is going to keep the security program in the in the line of what you want. So, um, and thanks for you know uh, top fiving my uh, my NIST CSF uh, kind of playlist as I'm explaining the controls, but those come from a framework. There are nationally recognized open standard of a framework. There are tons of frameworks out there and you can pick them. Um, I like NIST CSF because again, open standard nationally recognized in the US and it fits the bill for most organizations. My advice is your one person shop, start learning some level of governance and risk management and adopt a framework. And if you can get people to understand inside of your organization, here is a standard that we can follow. Here are all the requirements of that standard that we can follow. This is why we're doing it. Now, it's not, you know, me, Brian, one person, you know, one, one man team security saying we need to do these things and here's why. It's, hey, we all accepted that this is the rules. This is the framework that we're going to follow. And now this is why we're doing this. Now I'm just helping meet each of the controls. So like, and this is why I, I'm here. We had a little bit of an issue with the audio piece, but you get your framework going. You've got a number of different controls that you're going to set. You've now kind of just set basically what is the law, right, for the organization to follow. And now it's, okay, this is our number one priority. We've all agreed on that. And here's the roadmap that, you know, outlines that we're going to do this one. Check. Now we've all agreed what number two is. We're going to go do that one. So this becomes your punch list. And you can kind of fall back to, again, say, why are we doing anything that we're, we're setting out to do within the organization? This becomes kind of your bad guy, right? Um, my mom had a saying when I was younger, um, you know, if like I didn't want to like hang out with a couple friends or stay over someplace, she'd be like, just blame me, you know, tell them, tell them that I need you to come home. Just make me the bad guy. Blame me. Make your framework the bad guy, right? You know, larger organizations understand this by properly leveraging internal audit teams. You've mm -hmm. got a great relationship as a security leader and your organization is large enough to have an internal audit team. You make them the bad guy and they love that role because they know they're hated anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're on your side. You work with them. You make, they understand and know exactly what you want to do. They've probably been saying the same stuff that you've been saying all along. But now you've got somebody you can go, look, I'm just a CISO. Internal audit said we had to do this. You know? Yeah. I'm trying to help make you. Your framework, yeah. Make your framework work for you in that same way. Get everyone to buy off. Because most people now at this point are like, oh, yeah, NIST. Yeah, I get it. Right? In Europe, it's, oh, ISO. Yeah, we have to follow ISO. PCI. Mm, yep, we have to do those things. And now it's just, okay kind of turn into a bit of compliance, but it helps you structure why you're doing anything. So like, that's a great area to just go learn. Like you should know that. Otherwise you're just swinging wildly. What are you going to do as a one person shop, walk in and be like, mm, vulnerability management is our number one priority. Why? What told yeah. you that? Just because? Yeah. Well, and I would argue, I mean, if, if you, if you're feeling confident enough, you can use that framework or, you know, whatever regulatory body you have to, to implement, you know, control A, control B, control C, but like, it, yeah, let's put A in place, but like, it's not really controlling anything. You could put less effort there. Whereas like control C really dials into protecting your high value assets. You can spend, you know, more money there, but you can still justify and back it up with, you know, this yeah. is what the regulation says, right? So right. you can kind of tailor it to, you know, not all controls are equal, basically. Well, that's that's very true. There, that's very true. And and within that framework, you can see if you're covering kind of all your bases. Like, is all your with the NIST example are all your eggs in the protect basket, and you're doing nothing around detection and response? Mm -hmm. Okay, looking at it through that lens gives you a good view of hey. You know, maybe we got to stop spending money on protection. Maybe we do have to do some level of detection response, or maybe our recovery capabilities aren't as good as what we should or against our peers. If that's how you judge yourself. But like yeah. that's, you can kind of figure out like, let's spread the peanut butter, right? Across the whole thing, not just one area. Yeah. So uh, not, not a question from the crowd, but we did get a compliment. You're, I'm sure he's talking about you, Brian, your NIST CSS videos. Thank are great. you. And, and I actually wanted to, um, I had this pulled up while you were talking just so people can know um that this is brian's uh side channel his company but the this is the youtube channel so if you're looking for it uh he's got a ton of great information as he referenced i did a video for the youtube channel last week around uh seven incredibly you know awesome free resources and his his, his csf playlist was in there so 
you know, be sure to check that out, um, you know, after the show, not now. So yeah, yeah, watch later. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've done 17. I've got probably 20 more that I've got to finish editing on. And then I've got to record the rest. There's 108 controls in total. So it's, you know, it's not easy. I want them to be right. Um, no one's ever really explained each of the each of the controls either. So that was kind of something I thought, well, I've been close to this since it was ever since it was created. Uh, somebody's got to do this. So be kind of fun. Yeah, I certainly appreciate that you didn't uh, chintz out and just do the 22, you know, families or whatever they call them categories. I forget what they call the, the yeah. upper level ones, but yeah, yeah. no. Oh, you got to go in because that's the questions you get. No one asks like, tell me about, you know, identify governance. It's like, no, tell me about one, two and three, you know, like you get into each one. And then yeah. when one, one came out, that was actually the, the big push for me. Because looking at what they came out with with the new ten controls, I was like, "Yeah, this is th some of these need to really get explained." So mm -hmm. it's interesting, but yeah, it's a you know, it's a labor of love, fun <laughs> project. So we'll get there. It, it's enjoyable. Hopefully, you just keep adding to the playlist that way. If people have thumbnailed it yeah. or, or uh, bookmarked it, so that's the goal. Just going in order. It wasn't. I wasn't that smart. I'm just literally going in order as it's listed <laughs> in this CSF. So <laughs> you can kind of guess which one's coming next. Yep. So uh, you kind of alluded to earlier that you can't you can't do it alone, and you know we talked about the matrix uh, security team, but you know th there's bigger uh, entities involved. So like, who do you need to have relationships with outside of IT? Because that's who I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of that matrix security team. Mm -hmm. uh, who do you you know like if you're going to be successful, who do you have to have relationships with? And and maybe you could develop that a little bit further and explain how you might go about developing those relationships. Right. So I think I, I I think there's so I mentioned HR and legal right because those are two areas that you can that you can definitely dig into if you have an internal audit group within your organization that you're that large that's huge um, but get to know the people at the top of the business lines right if you're a slightly larger organization you got multiple business lines get to know who those people are um, you know because they're the ones who are going to help you when it comes budget time sway and influence the decision right get to know your CFO or your treasurer, whoever that is, right? Because they they are going to look at your budget request when that comes around. And you better understand what, how do other people get their budgets across to them? How does the CFO perceive the value that you're trying to bring and see the costs and why? Um, that's huge. Get to know your procurement people, anybody within a sourcing group or whoever's handling contracts with vendors, because you sure better be lockstep with when new vendors are coming into the organization and they get access into your um, into your data, access into your infrastructure, or you're just sharing data directly out to them, you got to know who those vendors are. What process are you going through? So you want those people on your side, right? Um, some other areas uh, that are usually overlooked is your insurance policy, um, and you can use that insurance policy that you have with the company to obviously mitigate some of your risks, right? It's one of the four ways to uh, offset risk um, or address risk. So looking at your insurance policy and then actually within that policy, right, you've probably got some resources available to you that you don't know about uh, that your provider is uh, making available. So learn what those are. You've probably got an outside counsel through that, an outside incident response team, some type of uh, identity and access or identity um, protection mechanisms. So there's some personnel within that that you know you should start kind of getting to know to develop into your incident response plan. But again, just to have that type of outside, uh, uh, you know, view um, of a resource that's not internal, right? You're going to tap it when you get to you know some type of incident where you got to turn your insurance, you know, file a claim, and execute your incident response plan, in some degree. So it's been kind of like the the matrix level of like high level people that I would want to know. Um, and then really anybody who's developing, if you know, you're a slightly larger org, anybody who's developing some type of overall strategy for your organization, or if you're, you know, blessed enough to be in something that's like an enterprise risk management team or an enterprise risk group, and that might be a matrix team. You know, you might be in a small enough organization that doesn't have a dedicated person doing, you know, chief risk officer. You know, you might be the, you know, the CFO, the president, whatever. It might be a committee of people who make up enterprise risk, might be, you know, uh, involved with the board. Um, if you're a larger organization and you have a board, know who's on the audit committee. They're traditionally the ones who are asking about cybersecurity and looking into that. So you can get some one-on-one -on -one time. Use that time to educate them. 
These people are not cybersecurity experts, right? And that's going to work in your benefit because you're going to be the expert. They're going to want to know about it. They want to get better. It's constantly coming up, right? Look at the NACD information. Cyber is a huge topic, right? They're really pushing directors to start talking about it and asking about it. Take advantage of that. Go educate these people on what your plan is, what you're looking to do, what your background is, why do they need to trust you? So like, these are a myriad of people, all completely outside of IT and security that are probably within your organization. And if you don't know them on a first name basis, you got you to gotta either start looking for a new job or uh, you, know, you got to start getting to know them. I mean, it kind of depends how long you've been there. I, I'm always shocked when I kind of you know, meet CISOs and I'm like, what's your relationship like with uh, the head of HR or legal? And they're like, eh, I don't really have one. I'm like, are you, do you not like your company? You know, I mean, like, yeah. why don't you have a relationship with these folks? Like, these are all really solid, solid folks. You want to be part of the business. Those are the people who represent the business. Yeah, I, I agree. And it, one interesting thing with uh, information security that's kind of different than I, I, maybe IT a little bit, but like information security really goes horizontal across the entire enterprise versus like, you know, HR, which is kind of, you know, vertical and marketing sure. vertical. So really having those relationships is, is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah, we had Chris Bradley, Christopher Bradley chime in here about how, you know, have a good relationship with your account and CPA so you know who you are when you're making money or losing money. It's a good point, Christopher. Yeah, yeah. Or if you're running any type of like internal financials, you know, run it through that, right? Show, mm -hmm. show your value when you're, you know, show where you can provide value to other parts of the organization, right? Show a business line where you save them money by making more effective security controls inside of an organization, right? Or um, help your sourcing team better understand some things so that they can negotiate better inside of a contract, better understand what limits of liability you're willing to accept on a contract when it comes to cybersecurity. Those things become really important. You're arming all these other folks to become your allies. You're making friends. That's what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to influence these folks so that when you need to call it in, right, they're on your side of the table, raising their hand going, give that guy the money he's asking for because boom, 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 right? Yeah, absolutely. So I was gonna ask you too, um, well, I have a couple of questions, but so you had mentioned, you know, going to the CFO and getting, you know, understanding how, what matters to her and getting the justification um, mm. in, in place. You know, InfoSec is traditionally a cost center. It's not, right generating revenue for the business. Um, it's very complicated and difficult to understand for people outside of out, outside of the field. So, sure. you know, what, I guess, do you have any suggestions, tips, best practices for oh, yeah. having that conversation to get money basically? So I think one of the, you, you're probably not going to do it with the, with the CFO initially, but what you're going to be able to do is have a conversation and arm your sales teams with, what the security of the organization means for them because the amount of assessments that are going on now on organizations by other organizations who have them as vendors is just is just going up and up and the questions are going to always come in hey tell me about your security we're going to be assessing you what does it look like do you meet these things the better you can articulate that and arm your sales teams or your business folks with that information not so that they can sell security to anybody, but they can immediately take that issue off the table when it comes up. So you're basically kind of like greasing the skids for them to just kind of make that a non-issue and just get into what it is that they're selling. Your company's selling software or widgets, arm them with all that and boom, now all of a sudden the sale should not have that as a hiccup. That's not going to be a stopping block, right? Arm the sourcing folks so that when they're going through contracts, what to already look for. So yeah, you're a cost center but you're now at least helping reduce expenses in other areas for your sales teams to go drive revenue. Yeah, uh, okay, so under that um, condition, that means you've invested in security so then you can then turn around and say, this is why we're secure here. But right. how, how, do you, how do you get the money? Like how do you, how do you get, like say you don't have um, a vulnerability scanner, right? right. You know, patch management, vulnerability management's huge. Um, and you need to get one and it costs, you know, I don't know, hundred, hundred thousand, we'll say, sure. You know, how do you, so I how, think, how do you ar make that argument? Well, you're going to use the, I think the two things that I've, that I've gone up. So the sales component, right. You're arming them with the forward facing piece. So if you're going into that going, Hey, I've armed you with all this other stuff, 
hopefully you're not missing everything. Hopefully that's the vulnerability piece, right? You have no vulnerability management program, no technology to be able to back it up. Hopefully you're going to the sales folks and saying, look, this question is gonna come up. We can't answer yes to this. We don't do this. We're gonna answer no. Make them realize that. Now you're bringing them into the court so that when you're going back over and you're like, hey, you know, I'm putting in budget to be able to do this so that we can do this across the board and this isn't an issue. Now they're on your side. So when you're going back to the rest of the business and saying, hey, look, we've got customers that are asking about whether or not we have this. And we keep saying no. We might lose revenue. This might directly affect a revenue line for us. That's going to be a problem. The business is going to look at it and go, okay, well, how much is the cost versus how much is the revenue? Let's make that balance. Mm -hmm. Other options, right? Do we have to do the Cadillac or can we get, you know, maybe a lesser grade version of vulnerability to just kind of check the box and kind of build up from there, right? You've got all that, you know, the thing I love about InfoSec is none of us are, are shy at trying to figure out or really trying to hack how we can make things work, right? Mm -hmm. And take advantage of what we have, right? So using open source solutions, low cost things, you know, working with, you know, just others, there, there's a ton of different ways to kind of get the initial solutions in and build up. You don't have to go right to the Cadillac. So bringing the sales team into that argument with you is going to be huge, right? And then the other piece is, again, within that framework lens, you know, you can, you can really kind of structure, hey, look, this is all the things that we're going to need to go do. Again, you've got to look at your security program as a program. You can't just piecemeal it because if you keep coming back to the table and asking for and asking for, they're not going to they're not going to take you seriously you got to be strategic with what you're asking for what's the roadmap um i'll tell you like you know some of the work that we do for for clients there's a lot of times where what we're working on is is just getting a conversation with a customer CISO to make them feel comfortable about what this what what our client is trying to do they might not have it today but it's on their roadmap and if i can articulate that to my clients customers and make them feel comfortable about, look, we don't have it today. They don't have it today, but we're working on it. We have this, we have a 30%, 40%, 60% solution. And we're gonna get a 100% solution in six months. Is that a risk that you're willing to take? Or do you like our plan? Do you feel comfortable? You wouldn't believe how effective that is, just being able to have that type of communication with somebody else. So I think articulating, building those friends, building your, like again, more of a matrix team, right? To, so you can go in and be like, look, this is the budget. This is what we need. Is how much revenue we might be losing. Is that worth it to you? Yeah. Right? Let the business make the decision. Yeah, that's a great that's a great um, suggestion and recommendation. As while you're talking about it too, I'm thinking, you know what? Even at a minimum, you know, you said the Cadillac, and then you got like a mid a mid mid level guy. There are open source options. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, Open Vaz is a vulnerability scanner, for example. Like you could put something in that's, uh, you know you know, it serves the purpose. It's, it's a compliance checkbox at a minimum, but yeah, you can, you can do that and then upgrade afterwards for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, get, just get it going. So uh, we've got a question from Brian here. Brian's asking, uh, you know, automation's playing a bigger role in security for a one person shop. Where do you think the ROI is greatest on spending time to automate? Hmm. Um, so my thing about automation is you first, before you start automating something, you've got to know if you can actually do it and do it right. Because if you automate something that's bad, you're just going to do bad faster and at scale. And that's not exactly the way you want to automate something. So don't jump into automation for the sake of automation. I think um, what I like to do, you know, what I ever charged my SOC teams to do was if you've done that function three times, put it up on the board, right? And the board was what we were going to go automate. Um, I like to see that inside of clients. Right? Can, is there a task that you find yourself doing um, you know, over and over? Test it, build it yourself, do it manually, and then force and go to automation. Um, I see a lot of people failing because they just go for automation first, bring it in house, and then figure out where to go make it work to justify your purchase, or your, right? So you, you've got to, I think you've got to really kind of feel the pain. I'm like, man, I'm just doing this a lot. I'm just doing this over and over, and then look to automate those. I think there's a lot of great solutions out there that do this. You know, again, if you've got to develop, if you're working for a software company, we've done this, you know, they didn't have to do a lot of bringing in an outside solution. You know, they had developers who were doing this, like just tap those guys and girls, bring them into your team for a little bit, maybe just get some project time out of them and have them help build out some type of automated solution, you know, within, you know, uh, you know what, whatever your structure, or your platform is that you're, you're trying to run on. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff can just be run off of main systems. You don't need something super robust. So 
I think there is, there is an ROI, but, um, you know, test it out a little bit. I don't know. One person shop, you know, um, InfoSec teams, traditionally, you know, they're not enterprise companies, right? So they're, they're going to be a smaller organization, mid-market. Um, so I think what I just said is probably a little bit more effective than sitting there trying to justify, hey, I want to spend 50, 60, $100,000 on this automation platform to do the job of somebody else. You haven't really proved out that you actually needed that person, you know, full time anyway. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's good a question. That's it. Yeah, thank you, Brian, for the question. It was a good one. So, a great um, name, by the way, Brian. <laughs> so, uh, we are we are uh, running long on time here. Maybe just one more question, Brian, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. No, this is good. So, so you had mentioned earlier that you know basically third party risk interconnections with uh, vendors, et cetera, things coming in. Um, you know, between that, cause usually it's not the InfoSec office saying like, you know, what we need, we need, you know, whatever Siemens in here interconnected and pushing data to, or whatever bank of America, right. you right. know, it's, it's always the business wanting to, you know, enable something. So, you know, shadow IT, you know, can be a problem and Hey, like we want this, uh, interconnection, you know, how, how would you recommend kind of getting in front of it. So you're, you are seen as part of the solution instead of like, uh, oh, geez, like, let's just, let's just go and see if we can get it in place and get around right. it because it's pain. I like, um, and I'll draw this out because I, I think this is a good visual. Um, th this is, this is where you've got to take emotion out of the whole process. So like one approach that I take is on a basic chart. Okay. I've got the value of the vendor or the solution to the organization, right? And I've got the risk level to the organization, okay? And it's increasing. The more that you can set up a, um, a bit of a structure where you can plot the vendors, right, into these areas, and you can set the ground rules for these quadrants, okay, beforehand, everyone kind of knows the rules. So you're like saying, hey, look, right? Everybody, everybody who's sitting right up here, okay? These are the rules that we're gonna expect for anyone who meets this criteria, right? We need to see, you know, we need to assess and we need to see a SOC 2, you know, type two. We need to see some type of attestation, right? Of whatever it is, right? Here are my requirements for this group. The more you do that and the more you structure it, the more it's structured and the more it's then adopted, by the business and implement it into their sourcing processes, the better chance you have of not having this like, oh, we just turned this thing on or we just integrated this company into us and we didn't follow the rules. So like creating more of this because this then, like I said, I started out, it removes the emotion from the sale or the integration or whatever it is because now it's not per vendor, how do I judge whether or not we're gonna do something and do we allow them, you set the bar here, right? Oh, I've assessed you, you're in this box, you don't meet this criteria. Okay, well, what's the what's the outcome from that? What's the risk to the organization? Are they willing to accept it? Or do we just say, nope, we need a different vendor, right? We do have another vendor that is going to do this. And that can actually be really good for your negotiations and your contracting and become leverage. Hey, our standard process is you're inside of our criteria. These are the things that we require, right? Now, I'll, I'll say one last thing. I know we're going a long time, but like the, the other piece here is that where I see a lot of people failing on third party vendor uh, risk is that they put this control requirements that it should be just for this group on everyone, right? These guys down here, I always made this joke. These guys down here are processing zip code data, it's public information. Why am I holding them to the same standard up here? You need to almost, you need to create different types of standards right, for different levels of risk to the organization. And by doing that, now you can right size the types of risks and the types of third party accesses or data sharing, or whatever it is, based on where they are kind of in a quadrant like this. And then you can say, okay, you know, for these guys, we just ask for, you know, an NDA and, you know, zip code data, what do I care, right? But like these guys up here, you know, these guys are touching PII we're going to ask for the whole kitchen sink. And that's how it should be. You've got to, you've got to right size where they are. And, and I don't think a lot of people are doing this. They're just kind of applying 
the whole practice to all vendors. And that's just not going to be effective. That's how you make enemies inside of your sourcing and contracting teams. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I would agree a hundred percent with you. It's so funny as you're saying it, I'm like, Oh, it's so obvious to have kind of different tiers, um, right. you know, based on it. But yeah, I mean, I know for a fact, I mean, I've worked at organizations where it's like, okay, this is, this is the kind of data we handle. So this is, this is our minimum standard. Uh, and, and, and like you said, you could have something completely public, you know, domain type stuff and, you're like, sorry, I just can't. Or, or it goes the other way where it becomes so oppressive and so resource intensive because you got to look at everything. Right. That, that the the high value ones get treated with the same level of rigor as the low level ones, and then you become right. slow, and you know people people want to go around you because you're an That's, impediment. You're yeah. By doing that whole like it's all or nothing for everyone, you are creating a roadblock that everyone will just totally work around. Right. Mm -hmm. There's you're not providing value. Like, how are you doing it? There's a again, that other view of all or nothing is a very auditor approach to cybersecurity. You can't and risk it. You can't do that. You're allowed to create levels. You're allowed to scale. You're allowed to make decisions. You're allowed to let the business make decisions because it's their business. It's not yours. Cyber is not, you know, the business is not there for cybersecurity. It's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well put. Well put. All right. Well, we, we had some uh, just comments in the, in the comments, uh, just saying great work, you know, really enjoying it. People are, are loving your uh, your responses, Brian. So thank you. Um, oh, thanks for watching. Yeah. So we've been talking with Brian Hoagley of Side Channel uh, Security. He's got, you know, a company. He's got a YouTube channel. He does all sorts of great, uh, interesting things. Brian, if people wanted to connect with you uh, and continue the conversation, where would you recommend they go? So you can follow me on anything here, obviously, at hashtag CISO life. Um, hopefully, I can get you on um, on that. Um, we've got a YouTube, just you know, some fun stuff. We just talk about whatever CISO stuff. Um, you can follow me there. You can follow me at sidechannel.com or really just Brian Hoagley on Twitter and on LinkedIn. So, Yeah, it's all good stuff. I, I, that's how you and I met, actually, just yeah. interfacing over the social social internet <laughs> right it's a social media platform who yep. knew you can make friends on a social platform it's great exactly. i love it man I've, I've met some great people i've learned so much great stuff from um from linkedin um i think it's a great professional uh, network and i've actually made some really good friends so um which i will include you now in so uh well thank you, you know. i appreciate that brian this is good. all right all right everybody well thank you very much uh thank you to side channel thank you all for attending and uh, until next time, stay secure.